This is one-on-one -on, -one on Plus TV Africa. Thank you for watching. My name is Elsie Godwin. On this episode, we're one-on-one -on -one with a business strategist, a technology consulting leader, and a co-founder, executive vice president, and chief operating officer of DBH Solutions, Osarete Oswald Kubadia. Good morning. I got that right, right? Yeah, you nailed it. Okay. I'm wondering how long you practiced. <laughs> I did practice. <laughs> All right. So as a business strategist, um, what would you consider the most common mistake done by business owners in Nigeria? Oh, uh, you want the most common? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that um, a lot of the key problems is around how we deal with staff. Okay. Right? So um, your business is, uh, is serving the market. Understanding your market is critical. Um, but understanding that as a business person, depending on your business, you have to use people to get to the product or the solution you're looking for. So how you understand staff, how you groom staff is critical in the business because staff can kill a business. So mm -hmm. it's very critical that you understand the individuals that you have, what the skill sets are and how you grow them um, to help deliver the solutions you're trying to deliver to the market. Okay, so there are people that would say um, business owners in this part of the world don't train their staff. So do you agree with that and should they do that more often? Well, I th I've heard that a lot. Um, and I say a lot of times that over the years I've come to understand some of the situa reasons why business owners do certain things. Mm -hmm. um, because I think the complaint that I've heard directly is that business owners are afraid that they train staff, the staff leave almost the very next day mm -hmm. thinking they've acquired something. And they can go, uh, because we're in a very transactional society, I think they can easily go transact that in, into something else uh, as in another job. Um, but I've heard from, I think we read, I think most of us know this, where they also said, what happens if you don't train them mm -hmm. and they stay? So going back to my original point, if you have these people you're paying, staff that work for you, and you're not training them, making them better, how do they help you get to your targets? Mm -hmm. So I think you have, to, you have to find ways of incentivizing people to stay and training shouldn't be, you know, not training shouldn't be the chain you use to hold them back. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it affects you overall. Okay, so looking at where we are going in terms of AI and technology and then people who would say human capital is one of the most important parts of your business, do you mm. think we are getting to that point mm. where we are beginning to shift and human capital would not be the most important part of your business anymore? Well, it's, it's already kind of happening, mm -hmm. right? So um, there's a list going around of the, 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 the jobs that you shouldn't have your children do, right? That list is already going around and those jobs will die. Um, there's somebody in California testing out how to flip burgers uh, with, a, with a robot. So imagine McDonald's now replacing all their burger flippers with robots. Uh, but I think there's always going to be a, a point where humans are always still needed. Human interaction is always going to be needed. Right? Okay. Um, and I think it's really for us to continue to evolve our businesses and evolve what people get into as what they train for. So that humans are always needed. I always think humans will be needed. I always think there's going to be interaction where, um, you know, certain tasks that are very repetitive will be taken over by robots and things that need the kind of a human touch to it will continue to be done by humans. Mm -hmm. So I would want to ask very simple, how did you get into business? Because, I mean, people come out of school, they've done their NYSE and they find themselves working. They don't see themselves as business people. Mm. They see themselves as employee, uh, employers to an employee, right? So yeah. when did you begin to see yourself as a businessman? Well, I think, I think you know, the, the, it's an interesting question because I think, I personally think a lot of Nigerians see themselves as entrepreneurs. Mm. I think the environment, I, I, it must be in the air and it must be for the... Um, but how many percentage of Nigerians actually see themselves as entrepreneurs? <sighs> Scary enough, I would think it's a really large percentage. Not to put numbers to it because we haven't done the proper analysis, but mm -hmm. I, I think it would, be, it would be a majority of Nigerians that see themselves as entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I mean, majority of Nigerians have jobs and all have side hustles. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, we all have employees. When you walk to them, you see their, their mind is somewhere else. So I think, I think it's either culturally or just because the environment lacks a lot that because when there's a lot of things to do like Nigeria, there's a lot of things that are not done a lot of lack so when you walk out your door you feel wow i can be the guy who does this new thing that fixes roads or i could be the next person to figure out a new healthcare system to deliver medicine to to rural areas somebody else is going fintech i want to do a new way of banking there's so much we don't have and the, and it, it, you, you you see that there's a large market so it, i think that drives people to want to to want to start a business right but your question was, why did I become a business person? When did you start did seeing yourself as a business person? Um, I, think, I think actually it was, it was said to me, right? So I never exactly, because I used to work in the States. I, had a, I used to work at Goldman Sachs in New York you know, years ago now, it seems. Actually, it doesn't seem actually it's years ago, mm -hmm. um, aging myself. Um, I think I had a, a, a supervisor who actually told me that he thought that I'd do better doing my own business. 
And I took that as a slight, but years later I realized that it was just the way I from my job, just the way I presented simple things, you know, the way the production I did when I was just giving, submitting paper or, or, or turning work, I had a certain flair that he saw that I'd be able to create value and sell value, right? Because that's what a businessman is, right? Mm -hmm. You basically have to create a product that you're going to sell to the market and the market has to buy it. So I think from that, from that moment on, I always, and especially when I started making trips to Nigeria, once again, the bug hits you. When you get here, you go, wait a minute, I could do this, I could do that. Um, the environment drives it. Hmm. So what would you say um, is the difference between a business owner, someone who you would say is born for the game, and someone who would you say, okay, just be an employee and grow your career? What's that significant difference? I would say it's attitude, right? Um, even, I think even when you, you feel that it's attitude and risk, okay. right? So attitude and appetite for risk, mm -hmm. right? Um, I would say even when you feel that you should just pursue your career. I think even when you take on more of an entrepreneurial um, mindset, you, you find that you're, you're more progressive in that said job, right? So if you, cause, because the, the, the things, the, the attributes of an entrepreneur um, also work very well with the person who has a job. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have a job and you are taking an entrepreneurial approach, you will advance faster. So I, I don't particularly think that that entrepreneurial spirit um, is, is, should be absent, right? Should be absent from somebody who, who, who decides they want to pursue a career okay. as opposed to creating their own business. platform, which mm -hmm. is what you do as a business owner. You basically create your own, I wouldn't say create your own career, but you kind of create your own platform which you're working on, right? Um, I would say that, um, that the, the risk appetite is what sort of makes a difference, right? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's, it sometimes could be seen as being insane to actually leave um, leave a job to go start something you have a passion about, right? So to, 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 to ultimately leave, I mean, to become an entrepreneur, you, you know, um, you firstly have to probably quit a job um, and then go start this thing. So that process can, can, be, can be somewhat daunting, right? Because you're actually taking a risk mm -hmm. and you have to kind of believe that this thing that you, that they, they may, maybe you're calling, but is your passion, is something that's going to feed you. That's what it comes to at the end of the day, right? So if you have mm -hmm. a family, it has to feed you, it has to feed your family. Um, and those are the kind of the metrics uh, which you measure it by. All right, so let's go on a very quick break. But when we come back, we'll talk about the business environment in Nigeria and the risk involved. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is One on One on Plus TV Africa. Before we went on that break, we we're talking about business. And I want to ask you how difficult would you say it is to run a business in Nigeria? That's, that's a, um, a question that has so many facets to it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's rather difficult. I mean, I mean, if you look from the regulation perspective, from taxes perspective, from um, the resource perspective, how deep the resources that you can hire perspective, the amount of training is needed, um, the market is very, you know, somewhat disjunct and sometimes dysfunctional. Um, it, it's, it's a difficult thing. I mean, I think entrepreneurs in Nigeria are doing are doing a, a, having a good go at it, right? Because the, the question is, I sometimes think I, I don't understand if people, if people who run business in Nigeria are actually making money mm -hmm. or is it just leaving, living off of the cash flow? Because sometimes you could live off cash flow. Cash flow comes in, cash flow goes out. But you do have a cash, there's a cash end where things reach a, a, a terminal end. Um, because I, when you look at, okay, good example. This morning I had a meeting I was supposed to have in the office with an important client. Um, they get there 8 o'clock, I get there 8 o'clock but my gen's down, right? So you can't plan for that, right? So the generator is not working, they're fixing the generator, I left them fixing the generator and, and I came here. Um, these are things that you, you, you can't plan for. You, you certainly can't um, um, consider the, the, the amount of money it takes to maintain that. So you're basically mm -hmm. providing your own power, providing your own water. Um, you don't have uh, access to facilities in the sense of banking, so you, you're not getting the operational, your operations funded particularly, uh, at least not at a decent rate. Uh, so when you put all those things together and you now start looking at the tax structure, you really have to wonder, you know, <laughs> why have you taken yourself on this path? Mm -hmm. Because it's a very difficult one. Entrepreneurs are the, you know, the backbone of the country, right? If you're going to say, here are some entrepreneurs, let's look at them and let's see how we can give them uh, lower taxes or no taxes over a certain amount of time. Let's see how the business grows. Um, let's see how we can guarantee a market for them, right? In the sense that, look, if you can do this 
uh, number of um, this metric, you'll be able to assess this amount of business. There's, I mean, there's a lot of business in government. There's mm -hmm. roads that are being built, there are buildings being built or should be built, mm -hmm. there's training. There's a lot of things that can be done that if we have entrepreneurs that can do them, let's give them access to it. When you just have singular champions, and when I say singular champions, just one business that is doing very well, and that person can now start diversifying into multiple things, Yes, it may hire 10,000 people, but they're still, <laughs> as they say, we are close to 200 million mm -hmm. people. So you still need to create a number, an army of entrepreneurs, an army of smaller companies that hire 50, 60, 100. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're really going to make impact. Okay, so to make this impact and to make our policies right, we need policymakers. So yes. do you think um, there is space for business owners in Nigeria to succeed in politics or technocrats going into politics? Aside the usual appointment of um, specific people to specific areas once in a while. Is there a place for them? Um, I, think, I think if there's no place, we, we, we must have to create one. Okay. Um, and if create is not the right word, I would say we would have to take one, right? Because I think, I, think I think politics has been given such a bad name. Um, even speaking out on, on, on matters of society and matters of business and matters that concern Nigeria as a whole, uh, you will find that the intellectual class tend to shy away from it. Mm -hmm. um, and they tend to shy away from politics. And, and it, it, it's kind of painful when you actually think about it, when you take a time to really study it and think, wait a minute, you know, if this country needs to get better, right, if, and, and we don't think it's us that will make it better, then we have a problem. Right, because the country needs to be what you hope for your best self. Right, mm -hmm. so it has to be you. It's us. It's us that need to fix it. It's us that need to go into politics. It's us that need to try to lead our country. It's us that need to bring the bright ideas. It's not somebody else. Um, I've recently gotten real tired of people saying the politicians, you know, and I'm like, wait a minute, why the politicians? Why is it not you? who's in that position to make that change, right? So we, we really can't sit to the side anymore and look and, and hope and have others drive our destiny. Mm -hmm. um, we need to step on, in, on the platform and actually make a stand and, and, and try to get involved. Okay, stepping on the platform, so we'll tell you to be in politics, it mm -hmm. requires a huge amount of money because yeah. there's already a mindset of yeah. even the people. So if you're coming to campaign, we expect that you are greasing our palm, even yeah. if whatever you're giving us is very irrelevant for the time being, yeah. but you're doing something. So yeah. do you think as a proper businessman who is very interested in your cash flow, your inflow, yeah. and who doesn't want to be tainted, would yeah. they be able to play in the political field when it comes to Nigeria? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question, actually. So what you're asking is process, right? So mm -hmm. process to change, transformation. Um, there's always people who take the first lead step to change how things are done, okay. right? The problem is that the way things are now, there's, no, there's ac actually no possibility of change. So there has to be like the first, the first like the, the lead first that go in and actually start to change how politics actually played. So we have an entrenched system, mm -hmm. right? So, and that entrenched system doesn't allow for certain people to be able to come in, right? It, it, it kind of allows like-minded people to come in. So that's why you see somebody just came back from America, the FBI is chasing them, but they are senator the next day. Mm -hmm. So you wonder, wait a minute, how, how, how did that happen? that happen? Right, because the system actually is built for that, right? So you would have, you would have people who go in and they make big sacrifices. I mean, there's one, Edo State. I mean, I actually watched him make the sacrifice. He was in Edo State working there for over eight years and now he's the governor, right? So he actually went into the system and now he's trying to transform the system. Okay. And that makes it more approachable for other uh, people to actually say, okay, wait, this is possible. If he can do it, then okay, maybe I should start looking at, you know, things like that. And other people in other states will start thinking the same way. Um, I think, I think you've, you've nailed it accurately. There's an entrenched system that we need to, which it makes it difficult for people who, who don't want to be tainted, um, who don't want to, to find themselves in any conversation that would, would question their, 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 I guess, lack of better words, honesty. Mm -hmm. I was trying to find a better way to put it, but mm -hmm. that's pretty much what it comes to. And, 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 want, and want to just live their life in, in, in a decent manner. So it, it, it makes it difficult, but we have to find a way because we have no choice, mm. right? Okay, so um, earlier on you mentioned something about the intellectuals and how they share their story. So I'm going to ask if you think successful businessmen and women, um, are they doing enough to mentor younger ones, to share their story and to let people, give the people the opportunity to learn from what they have been through? Do you think they're doing enough? 
The answer is no. Mm. And the reason being uh, that is because every time, and I just got asked this question um, two nights ago, please give me a Nigerian that you would consider you know, somebody to highlight. And I struggled, right? And the reason why I struggled is because the names I would give them would be names of people I know somewhat personally. Okay. As in, I know their story because they're my uncle, right? Or I know their story because a personal friend of mine, I know what they're doing and what they're up to. Um, but to just point out and say, there goes this person, is rather difficult. And I think one of the reasons why that happens is that people who, who have good stories to tell tend to stay very quiet. And I don't know why, hmm. right? Um, we find there's a lot of missing or incomplete stories, right? And if you ever listen to any story, for the most part sometimes, um, you're listening to a story, you find yourself, you're a jar, you're, you're a bit shocked, you're thrown off, but sometimes you just ignore it. It gets to a point where you hear so much of it, it becomes normal, that you no longer pick up on things that make no sense, right? But we need to, I've heard the thing about, you know, the singular story or the one perspective story is an issue, but I think we need to add to that list, you know, the incomplete story. Right? Because it doesn't help our youth. It doesn't help them understand how to go from starting point to success. Mm -hmm. Because for you to do that, you have to be able to follow a story. Right? You have mm -hmm. to be able to, to, to listen to the story and go, okay, he said he did one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven. Okay, so if I just follow one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, therefore, I will get to eight, which is a successful life, however you define it. Mm -hmm. But when you have incomplete stories, it's impossible to follow. So what ends up happening is that, you know, you now have this environment where, you know, effort and success is, is, is disjointed. It's not connected. You can't connect effort to success. You can't draw a straight line. They're almost two different things, which mm -hmm. is a problem, right? So if you have a society of that, then you start hearing things like, I, I went to sleep, I woke up, I hammered. Nobody asked a question. None of the questions asked. And when you have that kind of environment, it's, very, it's, it's almost impossible to create real value. Right? You create these fabrications, you create this Instagram life, you create, you know, it's global. It's not just a Nigerian thing. You know, a lot of times we're talking, that, like, some of these things we're talking about is just Nigeria. Um, it's not just Nigeria. It's just that in Nigeria we have so much we don't have. So we can't afford to play these games, right? I mean, there's corruption everywhere. Corruption is global. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a Nigerian, when you hear certain things in the news, you go, oh, somebody has, you know, as we say in Pigeon, somebody don't chop money for that. And we're talking about Italy. Right? Mm -hmm. They were just talking about uh, Venice and the fact they were trying to build something interesting there to stop the water. When you finish hearing what they said, you can hear that somebody has, the money is gone and the thing was never done. Yes. But they have advanced, they have advanced in the sense that their hospitals work. They have advanced in the sense the education system works. When you don't have those things, you can't afford to play these games, right? Because we are actually in a dire situation, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very different. All right, so let's go on a very quick break. When we come back, we'll definitely carry on this conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So before we went on that break, you were talking about, you mentioned two things I picked on, but the first one, you said something about um, starting from point A to the point of success. Yeah. So let's forget about those that are not telling their stories properly. Yeah. You have been there. We can say you have had a successful career. So what would you advise? How would you describe the process of the point of beginning to the point of success? Well, uh, one of the key things is running your race, right? I think, I think everybody has their path. Um, everybody has their story they're writing. Um, comparing your path to others is one definite way to throw yourself off. I'm, so, so in saying that, I'm not saying don't take metrics, right? Don't say, wait a minute. I mean, don't be a 16-year-old and being primary one, mm -hmm. right? So the only way you know that being a 16-year-old and primary one is by looking around. That's obvious, right? But don't compare yourself in the way where you're going, ah, uh, this person has new shoes. I don't have new shoes, so I must do everything to get new shoes, right? It should be more so, what is your definition of success, right? How do you define success, right? And then how do you attain said success? How do you get there? What is your chosen pa passion? What is your calling, mm -hmm. right? Is your passion your calling? As in, you don't know how to play an instrument, but is your calling, you feel like you must play this instrument, then go through the steps to learn it, right? So learn how to play the instrument, spend time with the instrument, and get very good and proficient at the instrument. And then 
see how you can create value with it, right? So now you're now playing on stage, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it, it's a process. There's no corner cutting. There's no shortcuts. It's actually a process. It takes time, right? It's, a, it's something that takes time. When there's a calling, it's going to take time to refine it. It's going to take time for you to be able to know how to sell it to the market, right? And after even you start selling it to the market, it's going to take time to amass whatever you call profit or revenue to be able to afford the lifestyle you choose, mm -hmm. right? Um, one of the moments ways I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs destroy themselves is by, is by choosing a rock star lifestyle while the calling they have, the process they put in place, and the potential revenue can only afford, I don't know, what is lower than that? Driver or whatever. Sorry, not to pick on drivers, but you get mm -hmm. my point. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're, you're in the wrong shoes, right? You're putting yourself in the wrong page. You're putting yourself in the wrong book, right? And the funny thing, about, the interesting thing about that is that you, you'd be surprised where this little thought mindset applies to, right? Over the years, I've had uh, interactions with several entrepreneurs, right? And you will find, especially with this whole startup scene, you will find that we have not spent the time to create our own version of things. Mm -hmm. We're taking copy and we're bringing it here and we're trying to assimilate this, this, this character or caricature now. And it never fits. It's like a over a size like on a two-year-old boy, right? It, it doesn't work because, okay, there's certain things that just don't apply to your environment. So if you're sitting there going, ah, this guy in America, in Silicon Valley, he started this company, he started this company, he started this company. I've actually met people who said this to me. And you want to do the same thing. Meanwhile, your first idea that you have, it does not really fit. It's actually three years out before it's, it, 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 it makes sense. How are you looking at business number two already when number one has not started? So you, you will see in that situation a lot of times that what that person is doing is not finding what is their calling, right? So they can now create a pathway, a process that would lead them to what would be a definition of success is more so taking the definition of success and trying to put it on. So I'm saying, taking it back to marketing, positioning and networking, what would you say should be the defining factor when making a decision as a business person, regardless of the fact that it's an individual race and you have to define your success for yourself? Well, it depends on the business you're in. Mm -hmm. right? um, so the different marketing, um, and how you position your business to the market, right? So not every business belongs on Instagram. But nowadays, it's becoming a bit blurry, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even a law firm, firm, you would say before, it shouldn't be on Instagram, but now you can still show so presence. So they want yeah. an online presence. Yeah, online presence. Mm -hmm. So I think, I, think, I think a number of things have happened. So time has changed. Before, you would say it just depends on the business. Some businesses are stodgy. They should just be where they are. You know, you know who they are, what they do, and you go to them. Um, and also who the business needs to market to, right? Um, so you look at the multiple platforms, there's Instagram, there's LinkedIn, there's uh, Facebook. Um, wh where's your market, right? So it depends on the business and where's your market sit. Mm -hmm. uh, in my business, the people who make decisions, well, there are a number of people who make decisions, right? So they're the, they're the people who are more design oriented, where you will find them on Instagram and some on LinkedIn. Um, they're the decision makers mm -hmm. who are the owners of companies and MDs and board of directors and so forth. They are more likely on LinkedIn. Um, but, but what I find is that the, the, over the years, um, my business is pre-Facebook, pre-Instagram. Over the years, we've done a lot of business via referral. Right? And, and that speaks to quality of work. So I would say the end of the day, mm -hmm. right, regardless of what platform you use, what's key is the quality of what you're delivering. Right? Because... I would say over 80%, this is something I can actually use actual percentage because this is my business. <laughs> over 80% of, close to 90% of the business we've done are referrals in the sense that one senior person sees my work in another senior person's place and goes, wait a minute, I like this, who did it, right? And, and, and so it goes. Um, then the second part uh, is also, quality is one, uh, I would say knowledge, right? Being knowledge driven in the sense that you know what you're selling. You're not just selling it. You, you know the, the details of what you're selling. When you're now, people now interact with you, they go, wait a minute, um, this guy's not just selling me a cup. He understands the ceramics. He understands how this was made. He understands what kind of heat was used. I mean, you know, when it's best to put it in the fridge. Believe it or not, that, that, that would get you far. Mm. That would sell to an intellectual buyer, right? That would change the conversation from, you know, I'm just using you to, wait a minute, I need to partner with you, right? So you want to be able to get to the level where you're actually partnering with your customer. Mm. Right? 
So you mentioned corruption earlier and you said it's a global problem. Did, did I mention corruption? Yes, you did. Oh. And um, I mean, our president, Mohamed Buhari, will yes. tell you he's fighting corruption passionately. Yes. Yes. So do you think we are winning? Or do you think this administration is winning at all when it comes to corruption? Well, um, I would say, I would, I would answer this from the perspective of my more recent political views. And my more recent political views has moved away from, from pointing at the top, okay. at pointing at political people. I've, I've recently just given that up. Um, I still believe in the political process. We should vote, be a good citizen, um, and vote your conscience. But I think it's come to a point where we now need to start looking at ourselves. Right? We need to start looking at each individual Nigerian, an uncle, an aunt, a friend, your son, your boyfriend, when they come to you with incomplete stories, challenge it. When your son, who just finished graduating uh, at school, comes home with a new Mercedes Benz and you clap for him instead of questioning where he got it from, that's, that is corruption. Mm. When your dad, all of a sudden, who works at the Ministry of XYZ or is just a second level at his private sector job, now is buying a house in London, question it. So that, that's where I want to start looking at corruption from, right? I no longer want to say, can the president solve corruption? He actually can't. It's actually more of a political play. You, you, you can't solve corruption when it goes down, like water going down a hill. It's not possible. Corruption is at the very level where you give a staff 100 naira. He's going to buy something that's 20 naira. He comes back and said it was 50 naira. That is corruption. Mm. And when it permeates throughout the entire society, you will vote for corrupt people. It's, 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 it, that's why. You know, if, if, if your may God is corrupt, he too won't see corruption in the guy who is corrupt he's voting for. So, I, you know, it, it's, it's, more of a, it's more of a gigantic task to say we want to solve corruption among everybody. Mm -hmm. But I really think that we need to start looking at ourselves. Okay, very quickly before you yeah. go, what can we do to ensure growth? And development is even distributed and not just in the cities, right? And also, um, the state governments can now begin to generate revenue for themselves and not totally depend on the federal government. Where do you think we should start from? Each governor needs to start looking at the resources which in the state. Mm -hmm. right? Nigeria is, I don't even know, is there a word larger than blessed? And Nigeria is a very, very blessed country. It's, it's, I mean, if you ever sit down and just have a conversation about the resources in Nigeria, and you don't, as a business person, you don't now put that into a process and translate it into, wait a minute, so you mean we have this so we can have that? Oh, my God. It's heartbreaking, right? And I think what's happened is that because we, we have sort of a welfare state, where most states are just looking to the center and saying, where thou it cometh my monthly allowance, we don't have enough people looking inward into this. I mean, so a few governors are. I mean, there's a few states who are doing this. And I don't want to mention many names because obviously we start with my state and those states because that's why I'm most familiar. Um, where you're looking and going, okay, I have oil, I have palm, I have this, I have that. What can I do with that? And what, how do I project that forward to creating value, creating jobs? You know, and I think these, these are the things that will start to happen when we have, lack of better words, more serious-minded people in these roles, right? Mm -hmm. Because we need to look at what do we do with the state's natural resources to ensure this state is viable and this state can actually sustain itself. Right now we have states that can't sustain themselves and that, and that, you know, that itself is, is the problem mm -hmm. and, and, and we need to start finding ways to address. Okay, thank you so much for your time. I wish you had more time, but thank oh, yes. you. <laughs> All right, that's it on this episode of One on One. Thank you for watching. And remember, you can catch up on our conversations on social media by subscribing to our YouTube channel, Applause TV Africa. My name is Elsie Godwin. I've been chatting with um, Os Osarete Osbad Gubodia. Thank you so much you for your time. <laughs> See you later.